our conference for uh, for this evening. And uh, it's a great honor to welcome uh, Timothy Morton. Thank you very much, uh, Timothy, for, for being with us. Timothy is a Rita Shigefre Chair in English at Rice University. And I've collaborated with Laurie Anderson, Bjork, Jennifer Walsh, Hammer Tears, Sabrina Scott, and many others. Martin, there is, uh, I guess, I don't know if it's my screen or not, I'm gonna continue. Um, Timothy Martin co-wrote and appeared in Living in the Future Past, a 2018 film about global warming with Jeff Bridge. They are the authors of the Liber Show for the opera Time, Time, Times by Jennifer Walsh. Tim Martin has written, all art is ecological. That's one of the main important research of Tim Martin, all art is ecological. He posts subjects on, human, on becoming human, that was in 2021, being ecological, that was in 2018, uh, published by Penguin, humankind, solidarity with non-human people, and many, many other ones. I just want to quote, for instance, uh, Ecology, Without Natures, published by Harvard in 2007, and eight other books, and more than 270 essays on philosophy, ecology, literature, music, art, architectures, design, and food. Tim Morton's works has been translated into 13 languages, and in 2014, they gave a welcome lectures in theory. That's a great honor, uh, Tim, to welcome you. We are very proud to having you tonight for us, actually, um, in, uh, in France. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honor to be giving this lecture today at this very prestigious school. And I noticed that you guys were founded almost exactly the same time as, as uh, Rice University, um, mm -hmm. which is, is, is nice. I, th I, think it's a, I think it's a nice uh, connection, actually. Um, and you know, my school, if you want to picture it, I live in Houston, Texas, where there's a lot of oil corporations. And my school, it looks very Art Nouveau, actually. Um, there is uh, a lot of, um, uh, it almost looks like it's made out of cake, but the cake is made out of brick, if you see what I mean. Anyway, this talk I've decided to give you is actually called The Human Form Divine. Um, I understand that one of the topics we're interested in is the notion of transformation um, of the self and, and, and transformation of, of uh, the ecosystem or ecosystems. Um, and in general, I think we're all interested in the notion of imagination and, and creativity and what can that do for us in, in actually a very practical sense. Um, and actually, that's part of the topic of this talk, because, you know, um, one of the ways in which we think about transformation in an ecological sense is um, a little bit too... Um, well, there's maybe two different ways of thinking about religion, and I'm going to say this word religion, in fact. Um, I personally think that there needs to be some kind of, of religion scale, energy, uh, quality um, to the way in which um, human beings confront this problem. Um, and uh, there's various reasons for that. Um, but the trouble is there's also a kind of shadow side to this approach, which is which we could call maybe religious as opposed to religious. In, in, in English, it's religious, the O-S-E adjective and um, this is very very common actually in ecological language whether it's in newspapers or books or anything music art anything the sense that there needs to be a very profound sudden massive change in ourselves um, is is I think a da dangerous and I don't think this is actually the essence of, a, of an actually like the religious quality to it um, and I, why do I think it's dangerous? I, I think it's dangerous because it automatically um, puts into the future the notion of some, some, some kind of something different. Even if the future is, is tomorrow, we have to change completely. Um, it's in a kind of certain kind of concept of, of conversion or repentance. Doesn't matter what religion we're talking about here. I actually study Buddhism, um, and, uh, but I was brought up actually atheist. But my, I became very, very in, interested in Christianity. My son right now is reading the Bible all the way through. He's 13 years old, and he's just gotten to the book of Samuel. It's kind of amazing watching him, watching him doing, it, doing it. And obviously, I come from a place that is very, very religious. 
And what a lot of people get wrong, if they're in Hollywood, for example, is how to talk to these people. Um, because really, um, a film like Don't Look Up by my friend Adam McKay, um, I don't know if you've seen this film yet, but he Adam McKay made this film, uh, Don't Look Up, with the um, production company uh, named after one of my books um, called Hyper Object Industries. He started this production company specifically to make movies and TV about very, very big, huge things that you can't point to all at once if you're a human being, aka the things that I call hyper objects. And global warming for climate would be one of these things, yeah. Um, now, the trouble with that film is that maybe, first of all, no one who is an evangelical Christian where I live is actually going to watch that film. Second of all, those guys already know, in a way, what the film is saying. They already know it much more powerfully. There is a comet coming to destroy the earth, right? Like the old medieval idea that, that, that the apocalypse would just literally be the earth bur bursting into flame is something that they're actually interested in. They want it, right? And they, so that's step one. And step two, the so-called lamestream media aren't going to cover it properly. And that's in the film. Okay, so the film gets like non-evangelical people a little bit towards their, their state of mind, but it doesn't really change their state of mind and it doesn't really get other people anything like understanding that state of mind. Um, and I think also there's another flavor in this film and I feel funny about this because Adam is my friend and it's a brilliant, beautiful film, but this is the problem with it, right? Um, the uh, feeling of, I told you so, you know, there's a lot of this on the left right now. Um, and I, but, but, but this also overlaps with something in evangelical Christianity, which is this notion of, oh, you see, you should have prayed a little bit more. You got punished. So you're getting punished now. It's like a sort of wagging the finger thing. And I don't think in the world, and especially in America, we need one more second of, of, of this wagging the finger. Ecological change shouldn't be um, staged as um, good versus evil, and it shouldn't be staged as efficiency versus inefficiency. It should be staged as greater amounts of pleasure, actually, greater amounts of pleasure, taking more pleasure in being alive, which means taking more pleasure in living in a biosphere, which is what you come out of, right? And therefore taking more pleasure in all the life forms that actually are part of the, the compose the biosphere. So I think a future ecological age is obviously going to be about increasing pleasure, right? Because dolphins being alive is presumably nice for them and it could be nice for us, right? And so on and so on and so on. And so I think, you know, learning how to enhance our pleasure and increase it rather than think about it in terms of becoming more efficient is very good. And I think in a funny way, if we're gonna talk about good and evil, efficiency for its own sake, a kind of, um, you know, art for art's sake of pure efficiency might be the equivalent of evil or at least very impolite, right? Like, so my cat is very good at talking to me. He's very good at making exactly the right noise that gets into my ear that makes me give him the food. He can, and he's perfected the sound over the years to get me to make, to, to give him the food. Um, and of course, you know, this is actually what we call rude, you know? Um, I wonder if there is a God and, and people are praying to this God in a certain way. This God is maybe saying the kind of thing that I say to my cat, right? Which is like, I'm doing it. I'm doing it already. You, you don't have to make this noise. I'm, I'm, do, I'm doing the, giving you the food, you know? So in that sense, politeness, which means literally just kind of um, being with other people in a way that is non-violent, right? Politeness is inefficient, yeah? Politeness involves all kinds of things like, you know, the beautiful French word, puis je voir, and, you know, all these kind of things that you have to say in order to sound polite, get in the way of efficiency, right? Um, and we have a very efficient system right now. We have a very efficient version of, 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 of capitalism. Um, now, in America, 
there has just been a law was passed that will encourage people to invest more in um, renewable energy, right? And they have decided not to do the carbon tax. The carbon tax wasn't a good, viable political idea over here, but actually that's quite good because what this means is that the emphasis now is on in increasing pleasure, right? Like doing a carrot rather than a stick approach is better, I think. And it also implies that the theory, the economic theory can change to incorporate non-human beings and, and also the future, future beings, right? It, um, capitalist economics is notoriously bad at considering non-human beings. And it's also notoriously bad at considering the future beyond a certain amount of time, right? But, the way I see it right now, you know, theology managed to change, right, from, from the medieval theology. You know, like if you talk to a theologian in the Department of Religion at my school, which is Rice University, a very, very good religion department there, um, you'll see they don't have a, a, a lot of views that were sustained in the Middle Ages, right? So if they can do it, then this kind of theology, which is very neoliberal, um, very narrow time frame. You know they can change it too. I, I'm sure they can change it too. Um, if 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 theology can change, economics can change. I think. So this is my main point. And 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 how does theology change actually? Um, well, my um, second job is is teaching literature, and one of my very favourite um, writers is actually uh, William Blake. William Blake, the English author who lived from uh, maybe 1770 something to 1820 something. Um, don't ask me, I'm just writing a book about him right now. Um, and um, he has this idea, which is also common in the work of Ludwig Feuerbach. You know, he's this early 19th century German philosopher who was an influence on Karl Marx. And um, Ludwig Feuerbach has this idea that religion is a place where human beings sort of um, alienate their intrinsic superpowers, right? They, they turn them inside out and they push them into some kind of heaven, which is basically the future, if you think about it. They push them into where you're gonna be going next, right? And, they, and, and, and whoever lives up there, right? Who is often seen as a kind of white guy with a beard who mostly wants to hurt you, some kind of psychopath type of a person, right? And um, Feuerbach does this by a very interesting method. Um, he just like flips upside down some of the concepts that you find in, in the scripture, right? So for example, he says something like, um, uh, God is love. You flip it upside down, right? You assume the verb to be must be reversible, like the equals sign, right? And so God is love, therefore love is God, right? Blake is not an atheist. Blake is just trying, is trying to rewrite what religion means. And of course, the, he, the brilliance of it is that you can, that he knows that you can be an atheist in the key of religion, if you see what I mean. Um, you can hold on to, everyone has beliefs, right? Because in fact, everyone in, has a belief about belief. Even somebody like Richard Dawkins, you know, famous atheist guy, has a belief about belief. Yeah, you, some people, I think him too, think that believe means you hold on very, very tightly to something. Some people like Kierkegaard think believe and me, think believe means you tr trusting. And this kind of believing is actually scientific believing because science is based on consensus because since about 200 years ago, um, truth, scientific truth is, is actually what they call in philosophy modal that means that there can be amounts of it. You know, like the Pfizer vaccine is 95% is effective, right? Or the Higgs boson comes within three, three sigma of probability. That means it's really, really as about as real as you could get that there's a Higgs boson, but they can never say 100%. And they can never say zero, right? If you're dealing with black and white like that, all you can do is the violence right, to back up your claim. So there's this Arabic philosopher from the Middle Ages called Ibn Sina, yeah, and he's got this idea, which is like, if you don't agree with these, this idea that there has to be black and white, true and false, then I will basically torture you 
until you do agree. But that's not agreeing. That's just screaming with pain and saying, please make the pain stop, right? So that's not viable anymore. We have to have a more democratic approach, which is actually like a scientific approach to truth, where there can be amounts of truth, right? You can have slightly wrong, very right, almost right, a little bit less right. You can have all these different degrees of it. And I think that's much, I think that's much nicer, actually. Um, so, you know, does, does, a, does a huge, what does transformation actually mean, right? Does it mean black and white changing suddenly from say a concept of being bad to a concept of being good? Or is it actually a little bit more mo modal than that? And actually do we have within ourselves, as it were, the capacity to do this? And yes, I think we do. Um, I think, you know, many of the great political movements that I like very much always have some kind of a re religious feeling in them. For instance, of course, the civil rights movement, or even thinking about Malcolm X or, 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 or Gandhi, of course, this is to do with the fact that, um, you know, religion seems to be a place where, again, lots of fantastic things about us as 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 sentient beings, and in fact, as life forms, are kind of squirreled away, they say in English, like hidden away up, upstairs. You know, they have this phrase also kicked upstairs. If you want to silence somebody, you, 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 you put them in the House of Lords, you know, it's kind of like that. Um, and um, so there's this poem by William Blake, which I actually wanted to, to read you. Um, but before I do, I need to say a little couple of little extra things about it, first of all. Um, and uh, maybe the first thing I need to talk about is the word philosopher before people get confused, right? So uh, I'm what people call a philosopher. Now, philosophy is a word that is made out of two emotions, right? And we love philosophy and Sophia, which is wisdom. Now, I think you, you, you would agree that if you had a choice between wisdom is a list of things to do, right? Which could always change tomorrow, right? Or it's a feeling. I think you would go with wisdom is a feeling. And I think the clue is the IA of the Greek word, the e Sophia, or the D-O-M of the English word, the, the dom means the, 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 the quality of wise, the feeling of wise, right? Everything has a kind of a texture or a quality to it, right? So philosophy is actually not about being right. It's not in fact about having ideas. In fact, it's in a way, in a funny way, it's, it's about trying not to have ideas. Think about it. It's like you're driving down the street, right? The street is called wisdom, Sophia, and all the lampposts in the street are the ideas. And you have to be very careful not to look too carefully, not don't point your car at the lamppost, right? Because then you hit, yeah? So ideas may happen, but the point is to actually try to like, like move all the time. It's the movement is the point. Emotion is movement, you know, e emotion. It's about things that are moving, yeah? Um, and this is a very important thing, right? It's, it's important for you to know that about me, that I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be sort of completely and utterly right here. I think being interesting is actually more like, it's like upper level from, from being right. Um, because I'm about to say something, which is that, you know, um, we, we require some kind of, of transformational energy, but this energy shouldn't be seen as absolutely radically different. Um, the energy is in a way from the future, but the future isn't radically different from now. If it was absolutely different from now, fundamentally separated from now, we could never ever get to the future. Um, and how can you know that? Well, everything in the whole world to me is a kind of um, collision or, or crisscross or, or overlap between past and future. What does it mean? Well, okay, let me show you this Blake poem. Now it's time to show you this poem. We can actually take a look. Um, let's see, share sound, optimize for video, doesn't really matter. Here we go. Um, here's the thing. Um, here's, the, here's the thing I wanted to show you here. Um, this is a poem called The Divine Image by uh, William Blake. Yeah. And the first thing to notice is that it's obviously 
the past, right? When you're looking at this poem, you're looking at a whole bunch of things that somebody decided to put on some paper very deliberately in this guy's case, because he's an engraver and he's making this on metal, right? It probably metal that he received from one of the people who had paid him to do a job for them because that was his day job. Was, was an, he was an artisan in that sense. He was an upper working class guy who was making, doing jobs for people. So probably people gave him copper plates, right? And the other thing, he's writing this in acid, right? He's dipping an, a, a pen, a tiny little brush, with very few bristles in acid. And then he's writing it backwards. He's writing mirror writing in acid, which is transparent onto metal. Yeah, with a tiny brush. What does it mean? It means kind of everything you can see, he meant it, right? You have to be really careful. And he probably doesn't have that many copper plates to waste. Um, and this is actually an, an early, early, early version of this poem. It's from a book of poems called Songs of Innocence and it's called The Divine Image. When you're looking at this, you're looking at the past in all kinds of ways. And this is not some kind of fancy speed of light thing you know, although that's also part of it. It's just a very ordinary fact that, you know, a whole bunch of decisions were made, either deliberately or not deliberately, by the um, author of this, and whoever else, right, whoever else was part of this, you know, like the author's family, the author's unconscious mind, the context in which the author lived in this town that he lived in, which was London in England in the 1790s, and the French Revolution a little bit caused this poem, you know, he was a huge big supporter of the French Revolution, um, and um, all kinds of things wrote the poem, right? Um, but all those things are in the past, okay? So there's the poem, and then you're looking at it and you're thinking, oh my God, but what does it mean? You know, that's the future. What does this poem actually mean is always the future. And I know that because I do this for my job and several years, many years, decades after I read this poem for the first time, I am now finding new things in this poem, right? The poem didn't stop sort of unfolding itself, right? Because of because time happened, right? So the, when you look at the poem very, very explicitly, there is a kind of overlap in the poem between the past, which is all the way the poem appears, and the future, which is what does the poem mean, right? And there is always this gap, and it's also a scientific gap, right? It's precisely the gap between what science calls data and the things that the data are about, right? Data is in the past tense. It is from the Latin word dare, which means to give. And data comes from this word meaning things that have been given, right? The past. When you're looking at data, you're looking at evidence about things in the past, yeah? And you can never find underneath the data the actual thing, all you can do is you can see patterns in the data, then you can correlate those patterns with other patterns, and then you can suggest some kind of causal link. And then you send your essay off to nature biology or whatever, and the editorial board says, okay, so your essay is nice and coherent and it's logically coherent, so, so we will publish it, even though I don't agree, it hangs together, right? That's how you do, that's how you make facts in science. But also it's how in general we interpret the world. Yeah, there's we never see things in particular, we only see data. Let me give you an example. I always like to use a banana when I'm doing this because it's kind of funny. Um, you um, think to yourself, well, I'll measure the banana. Let, I'll, I'll find out the banana by measuring it. That's a scientific data is measurements, right? But there's other kinds of data. Like it reminds me of my grandmother, or I always like to eat bananas. That's a that's also data, right? Um, but what you get if you measure the banana is just a banana measurement. Yeah, you bite the banana, you have a banana bite. You lick the banana, you have a banana lick. You write a poem about the banana, you have a banana poem. The banana learns to talk, and the banana goes on Oprah, right, on a chat show and talks about itself. And what you have there, you do not have the banana, you have the banana interview. By this time, the banana is very upset and the banana decides to go to therapy, right? The banana lies on the couch and goes, oh God, I was, first of all, realized I was a banana when this weird philosopher guy was using me as an example of what he calls object withdrawal in a lecture for, Fran for, for, for France. And it was very traumatizing. And I'm always triggered now, whenever I hear the word Blake, 
you know, um, that would be banana psychoanalysis. That would also not be the banana. Yeah, the, even the banana banana can't know the banana banana, right? They, they can only know the banana data. In the same way, you can't quite know this poem, right? But it's this poem, right? It's a banana, it's not a, an apple. Yeah, it's this poem, it's not another poem, right? It's this specific one. So there's a very interesting paradox here, right? Which means that the essence of the thing is, is definitely somewhere in this, somewhere near or in or near to this poem, right? But it's not completely in the words. It's as if it's kind of haunting the words, right? From the future. The future is not different from the present moment. The present moment's really just a tool that we use. The trouble is the way we use the tool right now is we block off the future and we block off the past. We think of the present as this little line you know, because we all use computers, or we think of it as a dot, because we all look at Wikipedia timeline, right? And we never able to um, notice how the future and the past are actually overlapping. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not different. It's because of the way we use this tool called the present. It's a tool to help you do things, right? I'm making breakfast this morning for my son, Simon. Yeah, and he's, I'm making some noodles and I'm cooking maybe a little sausage and, um, it was the, that that was the present moment, right? Before he goes to school for that task, maybe 30 minutes, right? If I was an electron, my present moment would be one femtosecond maybe, or nanosecond or something like that, right? If I was a merchant in 1600 and I was trying to get to the, the East Indies to get the spices from the spice islands, my present moment would be maybe six months, right? I would have to go around the Cape of Good Hope I would have to develop credit and debt instruments to be able to fund my trip. I would need to develop perspective geometry so I could see around the corner all the time, see where I'm going. And so my present moment is, is six months. So, so the present is a tool that you can define how you like, right? Just because Wikipedia makes it into a dot with the past and the future there, and it's a dot of a specific size, doesn't mean that that's correct. That just, that's just Wikipedia. Right, that's just Wikipedia's way of explaining it. Really fundamentally, what a thing is, is, is some kind of weird overlap between the past and the future. Like the way um, some kind of overlap between the shadows and the sunlight in, in a forest. I have this very nice garden in my back garden right now is, is what they call in English rewilded. Like I didn't do any gardening to it for maybe two, three years now. And it looks like it's a forest now. All the grass has grown up very tall. There's lots and lots of different plants there. Sometimes I get chanterelle mushrooms. Um, when it rains, I get maybe a, um, 500 grams of chanterelles um, in my garden. It's absolutely amazing to pick them and eat them and wow. Um, from, from, the, from the interesting gardening technique of letting everything else do the gardening rather than me. Um, so the poem is the future, right? And the past. And we're always confronted with this, right? And it's the same with working with with, with, with global warming, yeah? We shouldn't think that we have to fundamentally change. We just have to find an orientation towards the future. And where are we gonna find it? We're gonna find it in the past, right? We're gonna find it in these words and concepts and ideas that are like little bits of things that people have done and said and thought and felt for thousands of years, right? That's where we're gonna find the future because there's nowhere else to look. Right. And, that, and that's the fun thing about it. It's we're not actually caught in the past. Right. That, that we're, we're always there's always some kind of movement happening. OK, so I'm going to read this poem and see what you think about it. Um, and then I'll finish my lecture and then we'll sort of talk about it. Yeah. But the thing to get a handle on the how things appear is the past and what things are is the future. And what we are alienated from, in a way, is, is what we are. Right, which is, and um, so therefore we are alienated from the future. We need to unalienate ourselves. And what are we? We are biological beings living in a biosphere. And I think a whole lot of religion is actually about that. A whole lot of religion is about the feeling of being a biological being. You know, people talk in this kind of scientific sounding way about, about biology, you know, um, but actually it's kind of dangerous. Because, you know, that's a sort of reductionism. 
and it doesn't really describe what what being a life form is is like. I think religion's much better at describing what a life form is is like, funnily enough. And interestingly, I think also maybe the very mystical parts of religion, the esoteric parts, are actually very, very close to describing what it's like. All of them always say, it doesn't matter if they're Hindu or Buddhist or Christian or Jewish or whatever they are, Islamic, right? They all say the same, um, which is that whatever that is, God or the Buddha nature or whatever that is, right? It's right here. In fact, mostly they say it's in your body somewhere um, at the very high levels, right? And then they also say, but it's, but you, but it's just out of reach. You, always, you, you, you can never quite find it. If you think you found it, you don't have it, right? And so just relax with the fact that you can't quite find it because not quite finding it is finding it. In a way, it's perfect description of, 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 of how chemicals work. Yeah, chemicals in your brain. Brain signals always arrive a little bit late. Yeah, because chemicals don't go at the speed of light. And so what those brain signals are about is literally right here, but it's just out of reach. So I think religion is a place where this feeling is kind of hidden. And I think this feeling can get very, always like um, reified, you know, or uh, fetishized or, or, or turned into like a too rigid thing. For example, subject versus object, right? Object, all the stuff here, Subject, my thoughts about it. That's just an unnecessary abstraction. You know, what's really happening is my body is sending signals to my brain, which is also my body. These signals arrive a little bit late all the time because of time, right? And that feeling of I'm just a little bit, I'm not quite in my environment. I don't quite fit. How can I become more ecological? That's, that's where this question is coming from, right? How can I become more? Like, how can I do more? This religious question that people like to ask a lot. What can I do? You know, ah, this funny feeling is actually proof that you are a biological being, right? It's evidence that you are experientially. Yeah, you shouldn't delete that one. You shouldn't delete it and try to be, have this sort of really flamboyant, you know, religious experience or something like that. Um, you shouldn't do it. Um, and um, it's it, it, it's actually it's actually you, you, you've got all the tools you need already. It's just you have to just sort of change your perspective a little bit. And you know it is a little bit like being a parent or being a teacher. Um, if if you have kids, you'll understand, right? When you first have a kid, you think, oh my god, how can I be their parent? This is really difficult. I have to do something really important. And you get panicked, and then you become a less good parent, actually, because you're worrying about it. And then you realize over time, actually, it doesn't matter. I am a parent. I don't have to be a parent because I am a parent, right? I don't have to be a parent because somebody in the room knows that I'm the parent, so I can relax. It's a little bit like if you're a teacher, you know, like in the first maybe five years of teaching, I was really trying to be a teacher, and it was getting in the way I realized and then eventually I relaxed and I realized I don't have to be a teacher because I am a teacher because somebody in the room knows that I'm the teacher so I can relax then I became a much better teacher you don't have to be ecological because you are ecological yeah you do not require some kind of massive transformation something in here knows that you're an ecological being because you are you're a life form yeah all you have to do is notice right that you are already yeah and my cat for real knows i'm an ecological being right then my cat oliver is relying on me to give him the food every day he knows that he coexists with me in some kind of relationship right so we don't have to think anything special right we have to do things Right, we have to do things, and the thing we have to do is incredibly simple to say. We have to stop burning carbon. Boom, that's it. Right, you just have to stop it. The interesting thing is, how come we don't do it? Right, and one of the reasons why we don't do it is that we think there needs to also be a sudden huge change inside. But actually, there doesn't need to be a sudden huge change inside at all. That thing is, funnily enough, getting in the way. 
And so an awful lot of people who write about ecological things in the newspaper are like preventing you from being ecological. I know that sounds a bit rude to my to my colleagues, you know, who 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 write editorials for newspapers, but it, I'm afraid it's true because you know you you look at page one of the newspaper and basically it says you're stupid, right? It gives you a whole bunch of facts that you didn't know in the form mostly of, of quite raw data. It just sort of dumps the data on you, which we don't do about anything else. We don't do it about, you know, um, we don't do it about racism. We don't do it about economics. We don't just dump data on, on, on page one, but we do do it regarding global warming. And I think that's a bit of a problem. Then you go on to the middle of the newspaper and you get to the editorial section and the editorial section is saying, you're evil, you're a bad person. You're not being ecological enough you, and all that, right? And so I don't know about you, but stupid and evil is not a good place from which to launch a successful politics or ethics or any, any kind of creativity, right? Any kind of creativity, which what is creativity? Fundamentally, it's inviting the future, right? Creativity means you're allowing the future to be different from the past, doesn't it? Because you're creating something. That's what creating means, right? And in order to do it successfully, you actually have to be incredibly gentle, really, really gentle. I'm actually very good at writing because I'm very gentle with myself, with my writing. I just try to write this much, you know, every two days, just a really small amount, like maybe three pages. And it doesn't matter what the words are. It really doesn't matter. Like the words could be banana. I say banana all the time. Um, you know, the, it, it, they, the words could be, I don't know why I have to do this today, banana, banana, banana. Oh, that's a good idea, banana, banana, banana. And then maybe there's some idea, but there's quite a lot of banana. It doesn't matter. If I get to three pages, then I have a holiday, right? And that's how I get to write a lot of books because I'm not trying to like hurt myself or make myself or look at myself as like evil. I'm just trying to find the pleasure, right? I'm trying to find the the cheapest, lowest, like simplest form of, of enjoying myself. And you know what? Global warming is the biggest problem on the planet. Therefore, we have to make it be the most attractive, sexiest ever problem to solve. It's very easy to understand it that way, right? That the biggest problem must be the nicest one to solve, yeah? You want to be able to get out of bed in the morning and feel amazing about working on it rather than, oh, my God, I got to do, oh, this is terrible. I don't know about you, but when I wake up in the morning, I think terrible things about global warming. You know, I think about crop failure. And then I think what happens when it's like that in London with my poor mum, you know, 40 degrees and she can't handle it. What, what happens when it's every day? Right. And so, yeah. Many editorials are written from this kind of hangover, early morning mind place. But what I do then is I get out of bed, brush my teeth, go in the kitchen, and I make breakfast for my kids. And I don't share that state of mind. I have another state of mind that I'm going to share with them. And so I think this is the point, right? We need to we need um, loving, strong, creative, gentle rhetoric that's gonna help us to be creative and imagine something new, right? Imagining something new is actually how reasoning feels. It's the feel of reason. Imagination doesn't mean thinking up something that doesn't exist, that it's really bizarre. Imagination is how the actual thinking process of actually having a new idea feels, right? Everything has a feel to it. Everything has a texture to it. Nothing is just like floating around in the void and this is how imagination feels, actually. And um, true, tr truth, beauty, right? Beauty is how truth fe uh, feels, funnily enough. So here's the beauty in this poem. It's called the divine image. And I think you'll understand it even if I just read the first verse. T to mercy, pity, peace, and love, all pray in their distress. And in these virtues of delight, return their thankfulness. What does it mean? Well, when push comes to shove, as they say in English, right? When you're up against the wall, when you're in an extreme situation, someone's going to hit you. And what do you do? You, mercy, 
mercy, you just say it, right? Or you see someone else, they go about to hit someone and you say, for pity's sake, don't do that, right? Or you find somebody very, very attractive and you feel this love, right? That's why he says, love the human form divine. Mercy has a human heart, pity a human face, love the human form divine. These things are actually almost spontaneous intuitive things that happen. And what does it mean? They come from the biosphere. They come from your body. They come from evolution, right? It's very, very clear, for example, that art and language, ritual, comes from at least as far back as primates. Yeah, I, I can talk about it in the Q&A if you're interested, but even like Darwin is saying, beetles have a sense of beauty, right? Otherwise there would not be these iridescent wing cases. And this beauty has no reason for it. The null hypothesis, which is the default explanation for how everything looks, right? Like my shirt and which is my nice Ukrainian shirt, the light in this room, the picture behind me, the William Blake picture, everything you can see, including how cats look and beetles and, and trees, unless you are a cloning life form like a bacteria, the entire biosphere is made out of um, female desire for no reason no reason to it, right? Not with an objective of reproducing, but just with an objective of, wow, that's really sexy, I like it. And that's a very, very good reason, isn't it? To, to, to save the planet, yeah? Because actually, you know, these, these beautiful qualities that have no rhyme or reason to them, but are actually to do with creativity and imagination are not some kind of special thing that human beings impose from some kind of abstract heaven onto earth, they are actually heaven on earth. They're part of heaven on, they, they are coming out of our embodied biological being, right? And this is an amazing thing. Pity and compassion and generosity and all these things are, are, are traits in primates, right? Church sharing things and being kind, right? And so I reckon, you know, the, 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 the kind of, religious feeling that we need to inculcate we do need to inculcate it needs to um is, is 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 actually about this right this feeling inside this kind of surging feeling of inspiration and love and passion and everything is exactly coming to us from our evolution and it's coming for no reason at all it's just coming from random genetic mutation and the fact that having these feelings doesn't kill you yeah so this is a very good reason, I think, to save Earth, you know, um, and um, yeah, our, our, the, the, the essence of us, right, is our, is our future. And the essence of us is actually our physical, biological being, yeah, and it's always just a little bit off to the side, like when, like tomorrow is just a little bit off to the side of today, but I'm going to get there at some point, right, and I think that's the attitude. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to me, and I'm super happy to take questions, and I'll stop the show. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if we have any any questions. Um, if could be with me, um, president, with me. If you have any question to ask to Tim, um, or maybe it could be through the the group that I have in the front of me. Um, anyone would like to take the the floor to the to the group to the to 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 ask a question? There is one question I have, uh, Tim. It's about uh, the political approach about your um, about what what you do actually. To what extent it can resonate or you can put in perspective what you do about ecological approach and art and make sense and put in perspective with the political issue that we have today. It could be, it could be for instance, uh, people who denied about the climate change, for instance, to what extent this kind of approach can be helpful yes. in doing that? Okay, so um, we've, we in the ecological um, politics world, we've, we've hoovered up with our rhetorical vacuum cleaner as many people who, who say they believe in it as we possibly can by this point. But we need everybody on side. We need everybody on this, right? We need, for example, 
some kind of white male Christian voter in their 50s, 60s or 70s who lives in the south of the USA who is never going to watch Don't Look Up. How do we talk to those people? How do we get those people on site? Because telling them that they're stupid and evil is exactly what doesn't get them on site, right? This is the dilemma. And, for, and, and the trouble is, of course, that we're doing this in a moment at which literal actual fascism is now on the rise again across Earth. I mean, there are versions of it in, in so many countries, it's not even funny, right? Um, and, and the version of it in my country is particularly scary and intense and not just because america is of course still the richest most powerful country on the planet with a lot of nuclear bombs you know but that is a pretty huge factor you know so so what to do you know um fascism is an orientation towards the past right the phrase make america great again the idea that it was great mostly for white guys you know who got their feeling of great because great is also a feeling right it's, it's an aesthetic feeling they got their feeling from exploiting other people, other people being hurt, right? How do you actually talk to these people who've been almost convinced by that, right? You've got to find a way to amaze them. You can't persuade them, right? You can't force them. You've got to do something else. And I think, for example, this new law passed by the Biden administration is a good idea because it's about giving people more resources, right? Instead of trying to convince them, you give them more money right? And you make them feel better. Yeah. Also, you can change your rhetoric from you. In, if, 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 if global warming is about things getting really heated and big and intense and hot, your rhetoric should be cool. Okay. So I created this charitable foundation called Cool America over the summer. It's the Cool America Foundation. And our logo is the Pepsi can. Yeah, because Pepsi is, is red, white, and blue. Pepsi from the 70s, right? Pepsi from the 70s when the white Christian male voter was maybe 15 years old, right? And they didn't have any of this Trump stuff in their head, right? And, and, and the first time maybe white people thought it was oh, cool to say the word cool it was maybe the 70s like that. And Cool America, and the, and the purpose of the foundation is to educate the American public about global warming our only educational materials are the word cool and the word America and the idea of putting them together. Because on the TV now, still we have scientists and, and journalists talking science, and they're still trying to persuade people using facts, right, and data. And they don't realize that actually um, everything has a kind of texture to it, like I keep saying, everything has a kind of a how a kind of delivery mechanism and and the space that they're in is a space that's about competing beliefs right based on a belief that belief means holding on very tight yeah and so we've got science trying to convince a certain kind of religious belief yeah that doesn't want to let go what, what's going to happen the science guy already lost because they're playing a game they don't even understand the game Right. So someone else has to come on the TV, maybe me, maybe not me, but someone else has to go on the TV and say something different with no facts at all. They need to get people interested in the feeling of coolness. They need to talk about belief, actually. They need to say nasty, dirty words like praying or Jesus on the TV. They need to do things that Hollywood people don't do. They need to be more like what the Sex Pistols did. You know, the Sex Pistols in 1976. They went on a British TV show and the presenter of the show said to them, say some rude words because you're all about saying rude words. Say some bad words to us. Now, what people don't know is that in the commercial break, the presenter, Ted Grundy, assaulted Susie Sue, you know, from Su who made Susie and the Banshee <laughs> in the end. And the reason why they were saying these things to him, like you dirty, they said these really intense words to him. The reason why is because of that. It was this incredible, amazing Me, Me Too moment from 1976, right? Five minutes. Suddenly the Sex Pistols were everywhere, yeah? Someone needs to go on the TV or something like the TV and just blow people's mind with no ecological content at all, not trying to persuade anybody. That's what I think. 
All right, Tim, thank you so much. Thank you very much for um, this conference uh, today, tonight uh, almost for us. And um, that was a, a great honor, a great pleasure to, to welcome you for our, um, our evening for Imagination Week. Thank you and, um, and hope to see you soon, maybe uh, in real. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.